Sir, good morning. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Sir, before we um, start Mrs Chambers' um, evidence this morning, there's just a short statement I um, uh, would like to read, if I may, about some recent disclosure. Yep, of course. So you will recall that um, on Tuesday of last week, I provided an update to um, the inquiry on the post office's late disclosure to the inquiry. I noted that since the 3rd of July 2023, so just before the first disclosure hearing, the post office had disclosed some 23,000 potentially relevant documents to the inquiry, of which um, some 5, 15,200 are said by the post office to relate to phase four of the inquiry. Uh, I noted that this meant that a high number of potentially relevant documents had been disclosed in the recent past by the post office, and many of them were presently being processed by the inquiry. Uh, I also said that nobody should be surprised if witnesses had to be recalled as a consequence of this and other disclosure issues. On Friday afternoon and yesterday at midday, the inquiry received further updates from the post office regarding its disclosure. The update related to an issue that had been highlighted by the post office to the inquiry previously, known as the backup tapes. It relates to 37 backup tapes that the post office located at one of its sites. The post office had provided an update on the backup tapes on the 22nd of August 2023 in a letter to the inquiry disclosed to the core participants prior to the 5th of September disclosure hearing. Uh, just for your reference, no need for it to be displayed, the document reference for that letter is poll 20124517. That update had noted that the post office had identified some 42 backup tapes with unknown contents at a site, and that the post office had for some time notified the inquiry of the steps that it was taking to understand the contents of the backup, backup tapes, which the post office said were substantial in volume, including in particular whether the backup tapes might relate to matters being investigated by the inquiry. The number of the backup tapes was later changed in correspondence to B37. However, the post office noted at that time that as the backup tapes, quote, ordinary, ordinarily reflect a copy of the data that exists elsewhere, they are not ordinarily considered as key repositories to process and search for the purposes of disclosure, end quote. The post office also noted that, quote, the files recovered from the data sets sessions on the tapes may be partially or significantly duplicative of files already harvested, searched and disclosed to the inquiry. The post office provided a detailed description of the steps that it was taking before it would be, um, begin to investigate the backup tapes in that 22nd of August 2023 letter. This update was uh, detailed and largely of a technical nature. On the 31st of August 2023, the Post Office provided a further update on the backup tapes. This letter was also provided to the core participants before the 5th of September disclosure hearing. That's poll 20126338, no need to display. The Post Office noted that it had started its investigation into the tapes and was taking, quote, a two-pronged approach. Firstly, using technical, policy-based, and other means to identify whether the backup tapes contain meaningful new information, and secondly, concurrently taking steps to allow the post office to review the actual data on the tapes to identify whether the tapes contain new information." End quotes. At that time, the post office noted that it was not yet able to confirm how, lo how long certain steps would take, but that it would continue to keep the inquiry informed. and. Uh, would welcome our thoughts on an appropriate approach to adopt. Last Friday afternoon at 3.08 p.m., the Post Office sent a further um, update to the inquiry regarding the 37 backup tapes. Uh, that uh, backup tapes update highlighted three key points. Firstly, an initial analysis of the tapes as performed by KPMG suggested that the content of the tapes are largely non-duplicative. In other words, while the tapes are called backup tapes, they contain new material. 
they're made up of documents that are not already in the post office's relativity platform from which it reviews documents for potential disclosure to the inquiry. Secondly, after performing initial searches, it seemed that a significant number of the backup tape documents may be relevant to the inquiry's terms of reference, including phase four. And third, the date range of the parent emails on the backup tapes was primarily 2001 to 2008. The post office noted that this was a period where their electronic disclosure was more limited and the post office had therefore relied more heavily on their hard copy materials. In this sense, the post office has, um, it said, quote, a present working assumption, end quote, that this material may be unique, at least in the main. The post office noted that it was intending to prioritize the review of this material on a witness by witness basis. And with this in mind, the post office was prioritizing the documents responsive to search terms for Anne Chambers and Mandy Talbot. It noted that it had run some searches over the documents for Anne Chambers and Mandy Talbot, both in um, speech marks. And this had generated some 208 and 1,060 hits respectively, excluding families. The post office noted that they would provide relevant documents relating to Mrs. Chambers as soon as possible and envisage doing so informally by end of day on Friday. So the inquiry legal team considered this information urgently on Friday afternoon. In order to get a better understanding of the issue, the legal team asked the post office to indeed provide the documents responsive to the search terms for Anne Chambers as soon as possible, and also asked the post office to provide search hit results for the phase four witnesses who are to be called between today and Friday the 20th of October 2023, namely John Jones, Simon Rakaldin, Catherine Oglesby, Andrew Hayward, John Scott, Rob Wilson, Paul Inwood, Thomas Pegler, John Breeden, Alan Lusher, Alison Bolsover, and Marie Crockett. The inquiry asked for two sets of results, one with family members and one without, no later than 11 a.m. yesterday. At 7.03 p.m. on Friday evening, the post office provided documents that had been responsive to Rule 9 requests, or otherwise said to be of interest, from the Anne Chambers search hits of 208 documents. They provided 84 documents in total. In the meantime and over the weekend, the inquiry team urgently considered the 84 new Anne Chambers documents. The inquiry is of the view that none of um, the material is sufficiently relevant to phase four issues. However, that disclosure did contain new material that may be relevant to Mrs. Chambers' evidence in relation to phase three, in particular in relation to knowledge of and action taken in response to bugs, errors and defects. At 12.14 yesterday, the post office provided the search hit results for the remaining four uh, phase four witnesses to be called um, between the 29th of September and the 20th of October. This included expanded search terms beyond just first name and last name in inverted commas. So as you would expect, the search results from the backup tapes vary from witness to witness. One had no hits, some have hits in the hundreds, and some have hits in the tens of thousands. Indeed, one witness has some 93,699 hits when you include family members in a broader search. Uh, last week, I noted that as had been made clear on previous occasions, when the inquiry has addressed the issue of late disclosure, all of those on interested in the work of the inquiry, including but not limited to witnesses and core participants, should understand that the fact that the inquiry has decided to continue to hear evidence does not mean that witnesses from whom evidence is about to be taken will be giving evidence just once. I also noted that the inquiry will not hesitate to request further witness statement or witness statements from witnesses and call witnesses back to give evidence in the event that sufficiently relevant material is either disclosed before the witness gives evidence but the inquiry hasn't had the opportunity to process it all such evidence is disclosed after a witness has given evidence. This is not only to ensure that all sufficiently relevant material is put to witnesses, but also in fairness to witnesses, so they have the opportunity to address all sufficiently relevant material. On behalf of the inquiry, I repeat those comments now. 
Like other late disclosures, once the inquiry has had a reasonable opportunity to analyse the material that the post office uh, has provided from the backup tapes, the inquiry will disclose that material to core participants and witnesses as required. If this necessitates the need for supplemental requests, then those supplemental requests will be sent. Having spoken with you, sir, I make the following additional comments. On the 15th of September, you published a statement following the 5th of September directions hearing. You stated that there was a need for close monitoring of the disclosure process during the remainder of the inquiry, especially as it relates to disclosure from the post office. You also directed that the inquiry would hold a further hearing to consider disclosure issues on a date to be fixed in the period commencing 8th of January and ending 19th of January 2024. So your legal team consider that the material that is disclosed as a result of the backup tapes ought to be closely monitored alongside other issues in the lead up to the further disclosure hearing. And if witness evidence is required on the backup tapes, both in relation to specific documents that come to light as a result of that disclosure, or on post office's updates in relation to the backup tapes more generally, then it will be sought in accordance with your directions. So that's all I um, would propose to say on the issue of disclosure now. Sir, I think you're all um, still muted. I said thank you, Mr. Beer, and I would just like to add that as I hope has been clear from Mr. Beer's statement, he has been consulting me throughout the period since Friday afternoon about how we should approach what he has described in relation to the post office disclosure. And I, I wish to make it clear that I did consider whether it was appropriate to um, stop the process of evidence gathering. Uh, Having reflected upon that, I decided it wasn't, because I am satisfied, at least at the moment, that we can deal with the evidence of Mrs. Chambers and those who follow her immediately, and also, hopefully, deal with the appropriate disclosure to core participants of necessary documents which have been recently disclosed to us. But as Mr. Beer has stressed, I am keeping all of this under very close review, and if it is necessary to change the approach that I have determined is appropriate, uh, at least for Mrs. Chambers' evidence, I won't hesitate to change my approach. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Thank you, Mr. Beer. Thank you, sir. May um, uh, Mrs. Chambers be sworn? Well, does she need to be? <laughs> that was a question I was going to... She, she was sworn on the last occasion. I'm very happy for her to be re-sworn. Um, but is it strictly necessary? So I um, reflected on that, and I read the end of the transcript of the last session, and you released Mrs Chambers um, because there would have been a need for her to speak to her legal representatives. And I took that to be a release from the oath, essentially. All right. Well, I, I think... Uh, Mrs. Chambers, unless you have any um, objection to the course of action proposed by Mr. Beer, it's probably uh, sensible that you be re-sworn. And um, <clears throat> I'm not going to repeat it, but the um, statement I made to you at the beginning of your evidence back in May about self-incrimination applies equally uh, to the evidence you're about to give, all right? I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, declare and affirm that the evidence I shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you, Mrs. Chambers. As you know, I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. You gave evidence on the 2nd and 3rd of May 2023 um, on all of the first day and for some of the second day about the operation of the SSC, um, about other service support offered by Fujitsu to the post office, about the operation of Pinnacles, Peaks and Kells, uh, about problem management between Fujitsu and the post office, 
and then for the balance of the second day about some bugs, errors and defects in the Horizon system. Uh, I said that I would continue to examine some other bugs, errors and defects when you came back to give your um, phase four evidence. I shall do that probably tomorrow. And I should say I'm not going to look at bugs 19 and 23 when we get to them. They, uh, as it seems to me, are adequately addressed in Mr Justice Fraser's judgment in the, and in other documents that the inquiry now has. And so you're princ principally here to give evidence about the work that you undertook in uh, Mr Castleton's case. Yes. Before I get to either the additional bugs or Mr Castleton's case, I'd just like to pick up on four topics that we addressed on the last occasion where we've now got some additional disclosure that I would um, like to ask you about. Uh, firstly, um, ARQs and the SSC. Okay. okay. Uh, at the end of the last evidence session, this is on the 3rd of May 2023, Mr Maloney asked you about a work instruction that you had been asked to write by the SSC management team in August 2011. Yes. Um, there's no need to display the document at the moment, but if you want to refresh your memory, we can go back to it. The document is FUJ 00138385. And it was suggested to you that a reason that the management team may have asked for all issues concerning litigation to be forwarded to the SSC management team for sign-off might be a financial reason. Yes, that um, motive or purpose was suggested to you. And you said in um, summary, and I do summarise, well, that would really be an issue for your managers to answer what their motivation or purpose was. Yes. Uh, can we look at a, um, a, a document to see whether this sheds light on the issue, please? Um, it's FUJ 0015-4665. Can you see that this is um, an email thread dated the 8th of August 2007? Yes. It's copied to you. You'll see your last of the copies. Yeah. But it's a message um, to Penny Thomas and Peter Sewell yeah. from Mick Peach, your then line manager. Yes? Yes, that's right. And if we just read um, the message, Mr. Peach says, Penny, I'm not saying that you're confused about the difference between an ad hoc request, an ARQ, and a support call. I'm saying that the customer is either confused about the difference or is else making a deliberate attempt to avoid the cost of raising ARQs or ad hoc data requests by raising these as support calls. Bottom line for SSC on these problems is as follows. A, if it's believed there is a system problem which has caused discrepancies, then we will investigate as normal. This includes the calls passed over yesterday, although none of these calls says that they believe there is an FS problem. All of them actually indicate there's a mismatch in the figures in poll FS, cause unknown. B, if it's believed that poll are using the support process as a means of avoiding ARQ or ad hoc data request costs, then the calls should be referred back to poll in brackets by Liz question mark, requesting payment. C, if there's any hint of litigation, then we won't deal with the calls as support calls, but we will assist the security team in their analysis. There is a significant difference in the system now, which is leading to this sort of call, and why there needs to be a more robust application of the process. In the past, reconciliation on the system was done in two different streams within the FS domain. If there was a reconciliation issue or mismatch in the figures, then it had to be in our domain somewhere, even if it was caused by postmaster user error. The new system means that much of the sorry, that much of the reconciliation and audited figures are produced by PolFS, which is not in the FS domain, is a poll system and is managed for them by PRISM. Regards, MIG. 
you'll see that in the course of that message, um, Mr. Peach uh, says expressly, he expressly states that a concern is that the post office is using referrals to the SSC for investigations to bypass requests for ARQ data that are chargeable. Can you see that? Yes. Now, although this was before the preparation of the work instruction that you were taken to, does it assist you with your memory as to um, what the reasons for or the motives were for asking for the work instruction? That, that was the management's line, if you like, and had obviously been so for, for some time. I've, SSC were primarily there to investigate problems as they happened. If you get to the point that it's months down the line and the evidence is needed, um, then it was certainly harder for us to investigate because we would need to effectively get the, the data out of audit anyway and possibly this was then seen as um, if it's at, at that point in the process, then should the post office have, have been paying for it? But I, 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 I still think this is a, a question for my management, who were the ones saying this, rather than for, for me. I understand. Um, you see in the first paragraph, Mr. Um, Peach raises the um, suggestion that the client, Paul, uh, may be making a deliberate attempt to avoid the cost of raising ARQs, essentially by getting the SSE to do the work. And then in B says, if it's believed that poll are using the support process as a means of avoiding ARQ or ad hoc data request costs, can you recall whether this was a, a theme in your time that um. Um, was spoken about within the SSC? I think it it was seen that um, this this was a, an additional service that that post office were expected to pay for if they needed this data, and that was part of I assume was was part of the the contract between the the two companies. But I I don't know that. Although you may be right that the motivation for the request for the work instruction is a matter for your managers, either Mr. Peach or Mr. Parker, I'm asking you, can you recall discussion within the um, SSC about the facility being abused, essentially, by the client in order, in order to avoid the costs of ARQ data? It wasn't something we sat there talking about every day. Um, it, it's more likely that there were times perhaps when I was being helpful and, and perhaps you know, doing, doing more things than I should have been that should have been charged for. The um, paragraph two from the bottom, beginning, there is a significant difference. Can you see that? Mm, yes. Can you um, read that to yourself, reread it to yourself, and um, assist us, if you're able, with what it means? So I think the, this is talking about the, the back-end systems, which I cannot remember the, all the details of, but there was a, a big change at, at some point and post office's back-end database was now something called POLFS, which was not 
as it says, part of the Fujitsu domain, but was managed by a, a third party. Um, and so before when, even though it wasn't necessarily a front end of horizon problem, because investigation would have to be done by Fujitsu, then we, we would have done that. And Mick is now pointing out that um, now, you know, you've got two parties resolved, so Fujitsu perhaps should not be taking on more than their fair share of it. And so um, if an inquiry is raised or an issue is raised by a sub-postmaster with um, the MBSC and work is done, um, for example, by um, an investigator to um, either rule in or rule out a problem on the counter, is this paragraph suggesting that the SSC should take the position that there ought to be further work done behind the scenes at the post office to consider any discrepancy or shortfall before the SSC would do any investigatory work? No. Um, this is talking about the reconciliation between the back-end systems, not the counter reconciliation. But there were cases then when post office would be looking at the data that was held in PolFS for a branch and there might be some inconsistency with branch figures uh, whereas they that had been fed through from Horizon um, this would not necessarily well it I, I can't remember specific examples but but this is not the postmaster at the end of the week or the month saying I've made a discrepancy. It's more the possibly the two different systems having different numbers and post office trying to, to work out why that might be the case. And so Mr Peach isn't saying that the um, SSE won't do the work. He's just saying that it won't, he, SSE won't do the work for free. Is that right? He's saying that in these situations where there's some inconsistency between, it may be if there's an inconsistency between PolFS and the, something at an individual branch, um, I'm not sure, saying not sure that he's saying that that we didn't, uh, wouldn't look at that, but th this is less about individual branch things. I, I, I don't think I'm going to be able to get much further with this, sorry. Well, um, is um, looking at the email as a whole, Mr Peach saying that the SSE will only investigate once data has been requested by the post office through the security team. And the security team has asked for assistance from the SSE. It would depend entirely on what the problem was that we were being asked to investigate. Obviously, you know, day to day happening now problems, um, they would come into to SSC and, and we, that would be our normal investigation. This is things where it is post office, not probably not NBSC, but um, the people looking after PolFS and the, the post office financial systems at the back end, or potentially in investigating individual branches for litigation or whatever, um, those requests would come in through the security team. Um, and I believe it's, it's just sort of pointing out to Penny that she mustn't then just pass them on to SSC as support calls, but they, they needed to be considered um, as to whether they fitted better into the ad hoc request or the ARQ process. The, the paragraph at C, if there's any hint of litigation, then we won't deal with the calls as support calls, but we will assist the security team in their um, analysis. Can you remember whether that was fleshed out at all, what any hint of litigation might be, whether it was the postmaster alleging faults with Horizon, if there were unexplained shortfalls, if there were investigators or auditors involved? Um, what was the trigger for saying, no, we won't deal with this? 
um, this needs to be rooted through a security team. Um, this, that was a decision for Penny to, to make what she was hearing from the, the people raising the calls within post office. And so she was the gatekeeper, was she? For, for the type of queries and calls that are being talked about here, um, it is talking about calls that are coming in through the security team. What I'm trying to work out is how it worked on the ground in the light of this email after 2007. If a, um, a peak is raised with um, the SSC, how it was established, whether there was, um, this was a genuine support call or whether it was uh, something which disclosed a hint of litigation. Um and had to go down a different route. Yes, I th I, this is talking about the calls that were coming in through the security team, not the calls that were coming in through the help desk. So the whole email you read as being um, only about calls coming in through the security team? Yes. Yes, that's what it's addressing. Where do you see that? Because it's sent to Penny Thomas and is obviously a part of a, a discussion with her. And it's the, the top two people on the distribution list are the security team, and that's who it's sent to. And then it's copied to service managers and a, just a couple of us within SSC who possibly had been dealing with calls that had come in through Penny, and so Mick wanted to make us aware of what he was saying. I, I really can't remember. Can you recall any um, instruction or advice that where there was believed to be a risk of litigation, uh, which for the most part um, meant criminal prosecutions, the, the um, post office and Fujitsu should work especially closely together rather than bouncing the issue back to the security team and saying um, either you pay for an ARQ uh, uh, set of data before we do any further investigation work? Um, I think we were expecting, as I say, Penny to, to, to talk to her post office contacts and find that before taking it over. I mean, Yeah, sorry, I don't think I can answer you. Yes, in, in, would you agree that in cases that um, may be um, heading towards a criminal prosecution, it was necessary for the post office and the SSC to work particularly closely together to ensure that the right data was analysed and, if necessary, harvested and retained? Yes. I think this was, that was the responsibility of the security team, not the responsibility of SSC at that point. If, if there was examination of that data then needed in, in the run-up to a, a case, then um, I believe the security team would normally um, talk to Gareth Jenkins or, or somebody like that to do the analysis. And it's possible that somebody like me might then have been roped in to assist. Um, I, th I think certainly from 2007, you could say, yes, that was what would happen. But if, if a call had come in through the NBSC from a postmaster saying, I'm making losses and I think it's the system at fault, then, then you know, if, if this was a current ongoing situation, then yes, that would certainly be looked at by SSC <coughs> in the first instance. The fact that it might at some point later end up as litigation wouldn't stop us from looking at it at, at that very early stage. And, and lastly on this document, um, at the end of C, um, but we will assist the security team in their analysis, was there any developed... Um, written protocol that set out the steps that would be taken by the SSC in assisting the security team in their analysis 
of data where there was a hint of litigation? I have no recollection of anything written about that. Was there short of anything written, any um, clearly um, articulated set of requirements on what needed to be um, analysed, what data needed to be harvested, and no, what because needed to be retained? It was done on a case-by-case -case basis, is that right? Um, the, the data would have been the ARQ data and, and SSC had no access to the servers on which that was stored. Thank you. Um, that was the first topic. The second topic, um, if I may turn to it, Horizon Data Integrity. And could we look please at FUJ 0015-5493. If we just look here, um, we can see your email at the top of the page to Mr. Jenkins. Yes. And then if we scroll down, please, we can see Mr. Jenkins' email um, to you and others at the foot of the page. And if we just go over the page, we can see he signs it off. And so if we start at the foot of page one, please, and see um, what Mr. Jenkins said. Um, all, and you can see this is addressed to Alan Hodgkinson, Jeremy Worrell, you, Jim Sweeting, Chris Bailey, copied to Latoya Smith and John Burton. Yeah. Yes. Um, he says, Jeremy has asked, um, is that Jeremy Worrell in the distribution list? I presume so, but I don't really have any memory of him. Were there other relevant Jeremys in the SSC? Or uh, certainly nobody, that wasn't somebody in SSC. No. Um, Jeremy has asked me to produce a paper on Horizon Data Integrity to support the post office in refuting claims by postmasters that Horizon is causing money to be lost. I've put together an initial draft. I've ignored the front bits for now and I'm currently looking for comments on the technical aspects and in particular the comments in yellow. And then there's a, a character string indicating that there was an attachment, I think. Also, if anyone is aware of, any, of other material to feed in on this, I would be grateful. I've had a quick look through PVCS. Can you recall what PVCS was? And that was the document storage system. And a search through the TED. Can you recall what the TED was? No. And found nothing useful there. Note that this is not yet in a state to go to the post office. And once I've had feedback from all of you and anyone else you think is relevant, Jeremy needs to pass this through commercial. What was commercial? Um, I presume the uh, department in Fujitsu. Reading on, we have a conference call with the post office at 4 p.m. on Friday, so I'd appreciate any feedback by lunchtime Friday. And then a comment addressed to Jeremy, just scrolling down. Do you have any thoughts as to where this should be lodged in dimensions, I assume we need to make this a formal document. But if not, I'm happy to remove the front bit. And then it's signed off regards. Um, Gareth. Um, just going back to the distribution list, please. Um, can you help us with the other people there? Alan Hodgkinson, do you recall him and what position he had? He was one of the senior designers. I can't remember. So in the development team? Um, development or architects, yes. Okay. Um, you've said that you don't recall Jeremy Worrell. No. Um, uh, Jim Sweeting. I don't remember that name. Chris Bailey. He was another of the very senior architects, designers. Latoya Smith. 
don't remember. And John Burton? I think he was the manager of a group of development teams. And so he's giving you a paper, Mr. Um, Jenkins, and is asking you um, on his initial draft for views. You will see in the first paragraph, he says, Jeremy has asked me to produce a paper on horizon data integrity to support the post office in refuting claims by postmasters that horizon is causing money to be lost. Yes. Would you have understood this literally? The purpose of the page, paper was to be to support the post office in refuting claims rather than to explore whether there may be anything in the claims being made by sub-postmasters. Um, Gareth wrote that sentence and, and, and not me. Yes, but you're a um, recipient of it. W would you understand that the direction was to um, produce a paper that would support the post office in refuting claims rather than the more open question of an exploration of whether there was anything in the claims made by the sub-postmasters? Well, that's what he says he is doing. Yes, and how would you say, for example, you thought, well, um, I have got some knowledge about the way that um, Horizon um, is structured, and by this time, 2009, uh, by the way in which bugs, errors, and defects have manifested themselves, and how we in SSC and the company more broadly has treated them, I've got some evidence that uh, may assist claims by sub-postmasters. Would I, you have I uh, didn't in included that in reply? I was not aware of any bugs, errors and defects that were causing money to be lost without them leaving any sign that, that a problem had occurred um, in general, although, yes, of course, there were bugs, errors, and defects. Um, they were not causing continual ongoing losses. You, you've introduced so, a qualifier there, um, Mrs. Chambers. I was not aware of bugs, errors, and defects that did not leave a sign that they were occurring, essentially. Mm. Yeah. There obviously were bugs, errors, and defects that in some cases were causing money to be lost. But my view at that time was that Horizon was um, robust in general. There would have been specific cases when it was not. Uh, would you... The, I'm sorry. Uh, no, it's all right. Do you agree that this is um, suggestive of a request to uh, put forward the best case in refuting the claims made by sub-postmasters, making the best case for Horizon's integrity? That would ap appear to be how Gareth has, has put it there. I mean, my, my view was that, you know, I, I would investigate each case individually, which is my job, you know, when the support calls came in, um, and that, yeah, I mean, that, that's how Gareth has, has put it there. And I was not aware of, of, of problems with data integrity that, that were causing losses left, right, and center, leaving no indication behind them. Now, I don't believe that we have the 
um, family documents for this email. So I can't presently show you the um, draft of the Horizon Data Integrity Report that's referred to there in that character string, i.e. the document that you were being asked to comment on. Yeah. Um, we do have a version of the document dated the 2nd of October um, 2009, the day after your email. And um, when we look at it, we'll see that it appears to include or reflect the comments that you made in part. Yeah. Uh, can we scroll up to your reply, please? Um, section two, you mentioned incremental sequence numbers in the audit section at the end but could mention it earlier too, to make clear that each message has a unique identifier which stays with it when it's replicated. Each individual message has a checksum. Not quite sure what you should be saying about CRC read failures. We aren't currently checking old event logs for these when doing audit retrievals. And I don't want us landed with even more checks to make. If there are CRC errors, SMC normally raise a call and we trash the message store and let it rebuild, but probably don't want to say that, exclamation mark. But if we don't say, I think that's meant to read, will they ask, yeah. is that right? Yes. Will they ask? Event logs, more than 18 months, but not sure if it's seven years, and then paragraphs 3.1.1 and 3.1.2, the user will get an AP message warning uh, them that the last session ended in error, but it only tells them to check AP transactions, not others. 3.1.3.1, if banking recovery is not completed immediately after the counter is replaced, this is reported on the banking reconciliation reports and followed up. And so the part of the reply where you say we aren't currently checking old event logs for these when doing audit retrievals, I don't want us landed with even more checks. Can you just explain um, what you're referring to when you say, um, uh, in this context, CRC read failures? Um, this is when a message has been, a repost message, when read by a process, either on the counter that it was originally written on or on one of the other counters, um, every time it was read, the, the checksum on the message was recalculated, and if it didn't match, it implied there'd been some sort of a, a corruption. And that would raise a critical red event. Um, you say we're not currently checking old event logs for these when doing audit retrievals. As part of the audit retrieval process after 2008 and 8 sometime, the security team would also extract the Tivoli events for the branch over the relevant period and SSC staff would look at those events to see if there was anything in cons of concern. In particular, we were looking for the repost lock events, which might indicate some silent failure that might not have been noticed at the time. Um, this was a not exactly a time-consuming process, but it was part of the process. Um, now, we I can't remember now, but it, this implies that we wouldn't have seen those CRC read failure events in that process. They should, however, have been noticed at the time because they were one of the events that the SMC monitoring team were monitoring for. So there should have been a power help call raised at the time if these events were occurring on a particular counter. That power help call would then have been in the audit trail, so this isn't something that would have been happening and then wouldn't noticed as part of the, and, and, and would not be seen as part of the audit retrieval. 
you continue, um, the, the SMC normally raise a call and we trash the message store and let it rebuild. What do you mean by that? Trash it, trashing the message store? I think that's the bit that I probably didn't want to say, trash the message store, because it sounds horrible. Um, what it meant was delete, on, on the affected counter, you would delete the message store at a time when the, the counter, I mean, often, in, I, one thing I can't remember is whether these sort of errors actually shut down repost on the counter, which meant that you then couldn't use it, or if it could still be used. Obviously, if it was unusable, then um, it's not going to, this, this underlying error couldn't possibly cause any financial impact because you can't use the counter. But I cannot remember if that was the case or not. Um, but then trashing the message store is actually deleting the message file, the message store file on the affected counter, and then it would rebuild itself. And I can't remember if it used the the, and would would it would then be copied from one of the other counters to get the complete set of messages back in again, and that would then. Um, hopefully not have any corruptions in it. Obviously, if this kept happening because you've got a dodgy disk on a counter, you might still get, get more errors being reported, and then the action would be to replace the counter, which would, as part of that process, also rebuild the, the message store. Why wouldn't you want to say this? I think because trash is not a particularly good-sounding word. But there was a... a, a an acceptable way to describe what you were doing, wasn't there? Uh, that, that Without was using the word trash. Uh, the, yes, you would say delete the message store. Yes, that, why, why wouldn't you want to say that? Um, that you did, were deleting the message store and then letting it yes. rebuild itself? I, I really cannot remember exactly why I put it into those words, and obviously I wish I hadn't put it in those words, but I, I cannot remember my, th my thinking at the time. I'm not concerned at the moment with um, the, the word you use, trashing the message store. I'm concerned with, I'm asking you, uh, why wouldn't you want to reveal this yes. in a report about Horizon evidential, uh, sorry, data integrity? Yes, again, that's why I, I, I can't remember why I, really why I said that. It, it wasn't because I thought it was an absolutely awful thing to be doing. Um, what, what other reasons could there be for not revealing it? I, I, I don't know. Were you saying what they don't know won't harm them? It certainly looks as if that was what I was saying, but if that is the case, I don't know really why I was saying that, because this was not doing, this was, you know, to get the counter up and running again with a, a non-corrupted set of data. Or were you saying, because it's not going to help the post office prove Horizon's integrity, let's not tell them? No, I don't think I was saying that. Again, can you... Um Re reflecting back, think what the um, reason would be not to reveal this information in a report on Horizon data integrity. I mean, the only thing I can think of with hindsight is perhaps when these errors should have, had occurred, we should have specifically been looking to see if it could have had any impact on the anything, you know, if they were balancing at the time. And that wasn't a check that we were making at the time. But did I think this was a situation that was causing, was a cause of, of ongoing problems? I, you know, 
No, I don't. I, even now, I, I don't think that was the case. But no, I, I, I don't know why I put that sentence in those terms. Um, I think I just wanted to to let Gareth know of what the situation was, and then he could decide precisely what he wanted to say about it. But I agree that doesn't look good. You say um, SMC normally raise a call. Yes, that was the process. And then that was so, so we knew to do something about it. Obviously, if we had a, a call direct from a branch um, about any sort of problems, and then we looked at that call, we would have seen those CRC errors and, and would have looked um, to see um, what needed to be done about it. But I cannot be 100% sure that if, if they weren't, if, if they were saying, you know, that they'd, they'd got financial problems, <laughs> and we saw the CRC errors, then obviously we would look to see if, if they could have been a cause of it. But um, if we're talking about looking at data retrieved some years or months, months or years afterwards, um, again, if, if we were examining if we were actually investigating rather than just doing the audit retrieval, we would look for anything wrong. But no, sorry, I'm, I'm just not getting anywhere with this. Okay, so. you say um, the SMC was normally to raise a call. Were there times, therefore, when the SMC failed to pick up this issue or there were problems that therefore slipped through the net? I could not say that they 100% picked up on everything that they were always meant to, but they would certainly have picked up on the vast majority of, of things like like CRC errors, because that was that was their job to do. Was there a process to ensure that they um, ensured that um, that process always operated as it was intended? I don't know what their processes were and how much cross-checking was done by their management. Further down the email, when you're commenting on what were, I think, paragraphs 311 and 312 of the draft integrity report, uh, you say the user will get an AP message warning them that the last session ended in error, but it only tells them to check AP transactions and not others. Can you explain what you mean by that, please? Um, not properly without seeing the underlying document, um, but I think we're talking about um, what has happened when a counter has failed in, in some way and it's going into the, the recovery system when the, the counter becomes available again. You continue, if banking recovery is not completed immediately after the counter is replaced, this is reported on the banking reconciliation reports and followed up. Uh, did you um, either work in or see BIMs? The BIMs were produced by the, what I think of as MSU, Management Support Unit. Um, SSC did not see that system, but the data that went into the BIMS reports was often taken from peaks, which the MSU raised asking SSC to check out various reconciliation report entries. And then we'd send our response back and they would, if necessary, send a BIMS report, often just cutting and pasting our response, and that went to post office. And, and three point or your comment on 3.1.3.1, um, is that a description of what the process was, i.e. what was supposed to happen? Um, yes, I mean, if, if 
anything went wrong with banking transactions. Um, there was a huge amount of, of central reconciliation that was done, matching up um, the counter outcome, the outcome as known at the data centre, and also data received from the various financial institutions, the banks and so on. And all the everything was um, matched up in there and any inconsistencies gave an entry on the, the banking reconciliation reports. Um, specifically in a recovery situation, it's, it's possible that a banking transaction had been authorised by the bank and the money removed from the customer's account. Uh, but if it hadn't settled on the counter before the counter failed, then um, the, the money might not have, that transaction would not be included in the branch accounts. And, and so this banking reconciliation process was all intended to, to get everything into a consistent position and, and recovery was, was so, part so of that. So failures in banking recovery were always supposed to be reported accurately on banking recovery reports? No, if there was any consistency, any inconsistency between the outcomes and, and a transaction needing recovery, a banking transaction needing recovery was going to be incomplete until somebody logged back onto that counter again. Um, so, so that was supposed to be reported on a banking reconciliation report? It, it would all be reported somewhere if there was any inconsistency. And it was supposed to be followed up with a BIMS notice, is that right? It depends what the, the outcome was. It, when, when the recovery was completed, if the branch could confirm whether they'd paid the money out or not, then that, that would resolve the, the um, you know, the inconsistency, if you like, and then that will get fed, up, fed through and, and matched up in the, the reconciliation system. During your um, evidence um, back in May, you were asked to consider a circumstance in which a system error was to result in a BIMS notice, and you gave evidence that it wasn't your role to follow up what happened with the BIMS notice and later actions. Do you remember? Yes. And so where it says here, um, if banking recovery, et cetera, um, it is followed up, again, are you describing the process rather than your knowledge of what actually happened? This is describing, um, yeah, by following it up, I mean that if necessary, SSC would investigate what had happened. In some cases, we'd phone the branch to ask them to complete the recovery by logging onto the counter. Um, so essentially by this email, you're adding in some further points that may assist Mr. Jenkins to um, assist the post office in refuting claims that Horizon is causing money to be lost. Is that right? I was just trying to clarify where he had put things in his draft that I felt could be um, perhaps explained. I can't remember without seeing the draft whether this is in, in more detail or, or saying that, you know, he'd, you know, I, I knew a little bit more about the, the process at this level. Can we turn, please, to um, a draft of the report, um, FUJ, 3080526. Um, you'll see that um, under document status, this is marked as a final draft. You'll see in the bottom of the document on page one, it's version 1.0 and it's dated the 2nd of October 2009. The email exchange we've just looked at was the 1st of October 2009. Could then I if... just ask, is it possible to have this screen raised up slightly? Yes. Um, 
if um, do you want to try it yourself? If you grab the um, top of it, maybe one of the ushers can assist. I don't know if it. Yes, that's better. Thank you. We were looking at the date at the bottom, the 2nd of October 2009, the day after yeah. your email. And then if we can go to page three, please. We can see the version number 0.1b is said to be dated the 2nd of October 2010. I think that must be a typo for 2009. Um, and then first informal draft changes from version 0.1a were marked in red like this with strike out for significant um, deletions. And then this version, 1.0, version for release to the post office, yes? Yeah. And it's those um, 0.1a and 0.1b that I don't think we have um, uh, got. And if you just look down at the reviewers, you don't seem to be listed there. No. And yet you did review. Um, yes, I don't know how informal that, that first draft was, but yes, I did, I did review it. Um. Would that sometimes be the case that if you were an informal reviewer, you wouldn't be listed? I don't know. I wasn't... No, I, 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 I don't know. Or is this a description of those who are to review uh, this draft rather than those which had reviewed um, previous drafts? Yes, that could, could well be. I mean, we're now up at a, 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 a far higher level, if you like, of, 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 of people than the, the level at which I worked. And I'd note that... Um, Chris Bailey and Alan Hodgkinson aren't on there either. So I assume, you know, maybe you know, Gareth had just asked around useful people to, to try and get a, a picture in his, his first <laughs> very informal draft. Can we go to page five, please? We can see the purpose of the document set out. This document is submitted to the post office for information purposes only and without prejudice. You can see that, in fact, at the top of every page, it says commercial in confidence and without prejudice. In the event that the post office requires information in support of a legal case, Fujitsu will issue a formal statement. This document is a technical description of the measures that are built into Horizon to ensure data integrity including a description of several failure scenarios and descriptions as to how those measures apply um, in each case. So that's the purpose of the document. And then if we go to page six, please, there is the section on um, horizon um, data integrity. If you scroll down, please, um, if you just see the paragraph that's now at the top of the page, um, every record that's written to the transaction log has a unique incrementing sequence number. This means it's possible to detect if any transactions have been lost. And then right at the foot of the page, each record is generated by a count, uh, has an incremental sequence number, and a check is made that there are no gaps in the sequencing. So that was, I think, the first comment that you made, that whereas the sequence number had been referred to by Mr Jenkins in the audit section, which is what this part of the report is, um, it could usefully be explained earlier. Can you see that at the yes, top? Yes, because, yes. And then the, the second point that you've made in your email, um, if there are CRC errors, um, SMC normally raise a call, and we trash the message store and let it rebuild, but we probably don't want to say that. But if we don't say, will they ask? That that's not referred to um, here. 
or indeed, so far as I can tell, anywhere in the report. Do you think because that was a potentially tricky point, it was left out? I don't know. I mean, it, it, I mean what we were doing was, was fixing the problem and, and not in a particularly tricky way. It was the, the, the clean way to, to, to fix the problem. I don't know what Gareth had said about it before. Um, I think what he's put there is correct, but he, what he doesn't do is go into any detail as to the action that was taken when it did happen. And then if we go forwards, please, to 3.1.1 and 3.1.2 on the next page. Just scroll down, please. Do you remember these were the pages that, uh, sorry, the paragraphs, 3.1.1 and 3.12? Yes. Where you had said the user will get an AP message warning them that the last session ended in error, but it only tells them to check AP transactions, not others. Yes. And I think the point you were making, is this right, is that the sub-postmaster was not getting um, information telling them to check um, all transactions, only the AP transactions, yes? Yes. I mean, AP transactions were different to other transactions in that they were recoverable, whereas other transactions were not. Um, and so why were you raising that point, to, to make the distinction that the sub-postmaster wasn't getting a message to check other transactions? It must have been something that was in the previous draft where I felt there was a, 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 a little bit of clarity was needed, but I, I can't remember. It doesn't look as if your point has been addressed here, does it, in 311 and 312? Um, unless there had been a sentence in saying that the user will be prompted. Which is now gone. Which is now gone. That is possible. Thank you very much. That's all I ask on the second topic. Sir, I wonder whether that would be an appropriate moment for the morning break. So you're still on mute. It would, but I may have misunderstood something. I think it's page five of that document, but there, there, there is certainly a page that we've looked at which describes the version of Horizon to which it relates. Have yes, I that, misunderstood? That is, that is page five. And, 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 it, and it's the last it's sentence. The last part, this document only covers Horizon. It does not cover HNDX Horizon Online. Uh, am I being too simplistic? Does that mean that it only covers the version of Horizon which existed until Horizon went online? Yes, this, this covers the what we sometimes call Legacy Horizon, which was based right. all around the repost system, yeah. um, because the data integrity side of things, it, it was all to do with the way that, that repost was working behind the scenes. Horizon Online was based on a totally different um, set of centrally held databases. Sure, and at the date of this document, Legacy Horizons still existed? Yes. But had there been, yes, yeah, so the, the transition to Horizon Online hadn't yet occurred? No. But fine, sorry. I, I just wanted to be clear in my mind about that. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, let's have our morning break. It's at half past then, please. Yeah, fine. Good morning, sir. Can you see and uh, hear me? Yes, I can, yes. Thank you. Uh, Mrs Chambers, can we turn to the third topic, um, please, which is um, informal examination of issues within the SSC and the process for the examination of issues within the SSC um, that may end up in court proceedings. Uh, can we start, please, by looking at a, um, an email chain 
um, Fujitsu 0015 6153. Um, I should make clear this isn't an email chain to, um, that you were included on, but I'm going to ask you questions about whether what's in it reflected the position at the time. Can we go to um, page three, please? And look at the foot of the page, which is the first in the chain. Uh, foot of the page, please. Thank you. Um, so the 2nd of June 2010, from um, Penny Thomas to Steve Parker. Hi, Steve. You wanted to change the way we request these checks to peak. The, um, the subject is event analysis via peak. And I think we need to agree the format. Have you got a few minutes to agree process? At this time, we, we can see who, um, and we know who, um, Mrs. Thomas was, a security um, analyst. Um, what position did Mr. Parker hold in June 2010? Was he the manager of the SSC by then? Um, I think so. He took over certainly roundabout then, so I assume that, yes, he was the manager. And so your line manager? Yeah. And then if we scroll up, please. We can see his reply. Penny, yes, I'd like to change it as well so that we get formal peaks raised for ARQs as discussed last week. Establish audit trail, spread the work, etc. What do you understand um, that first part to mean? Um, we get formal peaks raised for ARQs. Um, I presume it means so for each I, for each ARQ extract that the security team were doing, um, where by this point we were also checking any events that were raised in the same period. Um, the, the request for SSC to make those checks, each one would have a, a peak raised for it. So for each request for an ARQ, there was a, an equivalent peak? Um, yes, effectively, they'd do the ARQ extract of the transaction data and repost events. They'd also get the Tivoli events and then raise the peak with the Tivoli events attached and route it to SSC for us to examine. And would you understand why it would be necessary or desirable to establish an audit trail? Um, I presume just so that somebody could say, if asked, yes, those, those events have been checked by somebody in the SSC. Would that be in the context of court proceedings or in other contexts too? I, I, I don't know. Okay. Before I can do this, we may need to talk to Tom as well. And I think that must be a reference to Tom Lillywhite. Can you see him amongst I, the copy list? I can see him, yes. Do you remember who he was? No. I'm concerned that if we put this on a formal level like this, it may mean that further down the line, random members of the SSC get a subpoena and we have to testify. If there is any chance of this happening, then we, SSC, will not be giving guidance on the events. We need guidance from Tom or Fujitsu Legal on how we protect ourselves from the possibility of court appearance before we formalise the process. Can you recall a um, concern within the SAC at about this time, um, that's mid-2010, um, that the SSC should not be, be, um, be giving guidance or speaking to um, ARQ data 
<coughs> because it may result in the SSC giving evidence in legal proceedings. I don't remember anything specifically from 2010, but I think after I gave evidence in 2006, um, the SSC management were not keen on any SSC members having to be put in that position again. And why were they keen that um, members of the SSC should not give evidence? Because they felt it was not our job to give evidence. And do you know why they felt it was not your job to give evidence? Because we'd had no training, it was not part of our job description. Um, you know, we, we did not um, take on the job thinking that we might find ourselves in, in court. And was that a, um, a theme that there was the subject of discussion, that there was a need for the SSC to protect itself from the possibility of giving evidence in court? Yes, I, th I think that was how our, our management felt. And what about individual members of the SSC t too? Yes, I don't think... I don't think any of us had ever joined a, a support team thinking that that is where we might end up. And so although um, there was a desire to formalise matters, is this right? You would understand what Mr Parker is saying here, that that formality can't come at the expense of exposing ourselves to court appearances. That seems to be what he's saying there, yes. I'm not sure that I was aware of this discussion at the time, though. That was my next question. Did you understand the relationship between a formal process for uh, administering potential litigation cases and um, an increased possibility of a court appearance by SSC staff? I'm not sure that that was anything I was thinking about at the time when I was checking these events, but obviously it was of, appears to have been of concern to Steve. I.e. an instruction, keep it informal, do things by email um, and discussion, otherwise you may expose yourself to giving evidence in court. Did that come down to the workers in the SSC? I don't recall anybody ever saying that. OK, let's um, read on, please. Scroll up. If we can just look at the bottom of... That's it, thank you. We can see um, Penny Thomas's reply. OK, Steve, I'll continue requesting via email until you're fully satisfied that the SSC are protected. Yes? And then scroll up um, still further, please. Uh, we can see um, Mr. Parker refers it on to um, Mr. Lillywhite. Tom, any comment on this, please? It's important for the ARQ process that SSC examine the events generated and then comment on their potential impact on the financial status of the branch. Would you agree with that? Yes. This has been done in the past on an informal basis, email to Anne Chambers normally, exclamation mark. Is that right, that it was normally you that received these informal requests via email? I don't actually remember. I'd forgotten that this was done on an informal basis at any point, but that's what it says. So. But that informal process leads to requests being lost when someone may be on leave, etc. Yeah. We need to formalise this, but I'm concerned about the legal implications. SSC staff are not trained on evidential requirements or as witnesses in court. That's something that you've just mentioned. Yeah. 
Um, just stopping there, I'm going to come back to ask you some questions about that in the context of the Lee Castleton case. Were, in general terms, were you ever given any guidance on when you were carrying out inquiries and carrying out investigations in a case that may end up in litigation that you had to do or not do certain things as a potential witness, like retaining your working notes? I think you're, when we were just looking at ordinary support calls, I don't think it occurred to any of us at the point at which we were doing that investigation that it could at some point in the future result in us um, needing to be a witness. Yes, just stopping there, I'm not asking about those ordinary support calls as you um, described them. I'm talking about these informal requests from security Yes, I don't think anybody, when, when we started checking these Tivoli events, I don't think there was any discussion when that process started that we might then be expected to appear in court about it. And no um, training or guidance that, look, if you do end up in court, the court um, has certain requirements for somebody that's performing a, um, a task of specialist expertise, no. such as retention of working notes, retention of um, copy documents, no. the duties that you might owe to a court? No, there was, there was no discussion or, or training. Uh, there was, I believe, a, a Kell that sort of outlined the sort of things that the, the events that we needed to, to, to check, but it, w it was purely technical. Um, Mr. Parker continues, if there is any possibility of a court appearance or a witness statement being required, then we have to refuse to process the ARQ requests. Do you know what the legal situation is here? Do you recall that, that it got to the stage that um, such was the concern about the possibility of giving a witness statement or making a court appearance that the SSC would refuse to look at the ARQ data. No, I think I was completely unaware of, of any of this. This refers to um, emails being sent to you on an informal basis asking you to do this work. Did that continue? Or can't you remember? Um, as I said, I don't remember ever doing it by email. Um, we did switch to, to peaks being raised and then they were shared out. Um, so it wasn't always me doing them. Uh, scrolling up the page, please. Thank you. We can see Mr. Lily White's reply. If there um, is indeed legal implications, and you all agreed on that, then I think we seek advice from our legal department. It's too important to get wrong. And then up to page one, please. And then scroll up, please, to look at Ms. Um, Mrs. Thomas's email. We can see her reply. Um, I'm not convinced there is Tom. You remember he said, if there are legal implications on the SSC staff undertaking investigation of these events and looking at ARQ data. She says, I'm not convinced there is Tom. While Anne has been helping us, she has been fully shielded from any form of post office litigation. Why would we specifically identify the checking of events as more vulnerable than any other part of the process, considering the total end-to-end -end process employed here? The names of those checking events for us are not notified to the post office, and we have the ability to identify and select any expert witness that we consider appropriate to support the post office's prosecutions. 
No one in the company can be forced to sign a witness statement if they do not want to, and the post office cannot cherry pick our staff. Gareth has the responsibility of covering transaction records for all litigation facing activity until now, and there has been no issue. Do we need to identify a suitable, in inverted commas, expert to cover event filtration and analysis? That's um, another question. Was that the subject of discussion within the SSC, that you had been shielded from involvement in post office litigation? I don't recall it ever being discussed. Obviously, I knew that after the Marine Drive case that I'd been involved in, um, Gareth had taken on um, subsequent uh, witness statements and trials. Um, but I, I don't recall any discussion about it. What about the point that the names of those checking events for us are not notified to the post office? Was that an instruction that was um, given? Don't tell the post office who carried out the work because otherwise they might end up a witness in court. No, I don't recall that ever being said or discussed. Was the facility available to um, obscure from the post office who was carrying out the work checking the events analysis? I don't know what got passed to the post office as a result of the events analysis. I mean, that all went, just went straight back to the security team and, and I, I don't know precisely what Penny then passed on um, as part of the ARQ data. Do you recall whether you or others in the team were told, don't worry, even though you're responding to these informal requests for analysis, we um, shield you by not revealing who undertook the work when we pass the product back to the post office? I don't recall any of us ever explicitly worrying about that or, or thinking that it was something to be concerned about. As a means of ensuring that what happened in the Marine Drive case didn't happen again, that the SSC was dragged into giving evidence. I, I, I don't think it was something that, that, that we were particularly thinking about. The checking of the events was a task that needed to be done and we did it and, and passed it back. I don't think we considered possible consequences, although in the light of Marine Drive, maybe it's something we should have been more alert to. But it, no, it wasn't something that, that we were th talking about or, or considering. And after Marine Drive, I think it's right that no one from the SSE did give evidence again. Yeah. Do you know how that came about? I presume that was a decision um, by the management who, I think for various reasons, weren't happy that I'd had to give evidence in the first place. But you in the SSC carried on doing the analysis. We did. And passing it back to security. I became involved in Marine Drive because I dealt with the original support call from the branch, um, which did not go back to security because it went back to, to, to Marine Drive. Um, where I, I, I mean, after that, um, I think Gareth took responsibility for um, making checks on other branches for the, the transaction data for, for litigation where it was coming in through the security team. And I occasionally, a few occasions, possibly helped him with some of that analysis. Um, but Were you doing so in the knowledge that your identity would not be revealed to 
the post office, so there was no prospect of you having to give evidence? I think I always assumed that, that um, it would be Gareth giving evidence. I, I, I don't think I considered whether my identity or my involvement was being hidden to protect me or anything. Um, I, by that point, it just seemed to be the, the process that, that, that Gareth, as it says here, had taken that responsibility. And do you know how that process came about, that Gareth had taken responsibility? No. Can we turn to the fourth issue um, then, please? That can come down. Uh, back when you gave your evidence on the 3rd of May, um, you described um, an occasion when the post office had wanted to insert transactions um, without the branch being aware. I'll just read um, back the questions and answers. Um, the question was, was there any method to alert others that corrective action had been taken to insert data or extra messages into a branch's account? And you said uh, the ARQ data would contain both the original transaction and the corrective transaction at the point at which they were done. If the full unfiltered data was retrieved and inspected, then that would show the comment, for example. Certainly sometimes for counter corrections, and it wasn't done consistently, but we often might use a counter number that didn't exist to make it clear that it was something out of the ordinary, or a username, including SSC, again to show that it was something out of the ordinary. That wasn't done on this specific one, and I cannot remember whether that was because I was specifically asked not to, or I was just producing a transaction that was absolutely a mirror of the one that shouldn't have been there in the first place, and all I did was change the signs of the values effectively, and all I, I left all the other data in there as it was. And so, remembering back what you were saying, and just to um, synthesize it, you were saying sometimes a fictitious um, counter number was used to mark out the transaction correction? As I recall, yes. Um, secondly, you were saying, but that wasn't done um, consistently, i.e. the use of a fictitious counter number to mark out the fact that the SSC had made a correction. Yeah. And thirdly, you were doing that, um, or the SSC was doing that um, deliberately, i.e. using the fictitious counter number, because um, you would want to show that an SSC member had been making the correction. Yes. But fourthly, there might be occasions when you were specifically asked not to use the fictitious one. I don't think we were ever asked not to use a fictitious one. It was just a passage of your evidence where you said that wasn't done on this occasion, and I can't remember whether that was because I was specifically asked not to, which tended to indicate that you were saying that you may have been asked not to use the specific, uh, the fictitious number. I don't recall ever being asked not to do that, and I can't remember which specific instance we're, we're talking about here. Um, sorry. Overall, does it mean that it was possible for members of the SSE to insert transactions using the branch user ID? Right, you're talking about user ID here now yep. rather than um, counter number. But um, yes, it, it was, I mean, the messages that we inserted could have contained the, the branch user ID. And would it follow that um, standard filtered ARQ data would not distinguish those um, insertions from those that were in fact carried out in the branch? Uh, the standard ARQ data, yes. You might not be able to see the difference. So transactions which appeared in the standard filtered ARQ data 
for example, in Mr. Castleton's case, with his ID user number next to them, it, would not necessarily mean that they were carried out by him. It would have been possible, yes, for SSC to put transactions in that... Using his ID? Using his ID. Without leaving a fingerprint on the standard ARQ, filtered ARQ data, that that had been done? Um, yes, I think that would have been possible. It shouldn't have been done, but it could be done. Yes, I don't think there's anything that would have prevented that. I don't, th I don't believe that was done, but I can't say it's an impossibility. Can I turn then to Mr. Castleton's um, case and begin um, with what you did and didn't know, um, what information you did have and what information you didn't have, and the stage at which you became involved. And I'm going to try and do it um, chrono chronologically, including by establishing what had happened before your first involvement, which was, I think, on the 26th of February 2004. Yes. Yes? Yes. I'm afraid there's quite a long run up to the wicket here, but I just want to see what had happened before you became involved. Certainly. Can we um, start, please, um, with the first call on the 14th of January 2004? And um, you address this in your um, uh, witness statement, please. So that is um, WITN 00170200. Uh, WITN 0017 I'm told, sir, that's not on the system, which is remarkable because it's uh, Mrs. Chambers' 38 page second witness statement. Maybe if I just hand my copy of it to the operators to see whether it's an error in my reading. Uh, um, we probably need to take a break then, if um, um, that is yeah. indeed not on the system. I apologise for this. Can we leave it that we'll come back to you when it is on the system, please? Okay, um, that's fine. Do you, uh, do you want me to sit in my chair, so to speak, for a few minutes, or can I wander around safely for at least five minutes? Um, at the latter, please, um, uh, sir, and we'll, we'll get you a message um, one way or the other when we're to reconvene. Thank you very much, sir. Good afternoon. Can you now see and hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you. Thank you. Apologies um, for that protracted delay. Uh, can we look, please, um, at WITN 0017-0200? And can we go, please, to page three of your witness statement and look at um, paragraph 10, please. Uh, I should have um, taken you to the heading at the top of the page. Involvement in relation to Marine Drive Post Office and the litigation against Lee Castleton. So this is the section of your statement, indeed the rest of the statement, which deals with um, Mr. Castleton's case. And at paragraph 10, you say, I've now been provided with a copy of the MBSC call log for Marine Drive. This is not something that was ever available to me during my time at Fujitsu. As I've explained in my first statement, there was a clear division between business investigations conducted by MBSC and system investigations conducted by the SSC. 
I can see now from this document that there was a call about a discrepancy in Marine Drive on the 14th of January 2004 and another a week later on the 21st of January 2004. And the record shows MBSC is assisting the postmaster to make checks at that time. And so where you say um, this is the first time that I've seen the MBSC call log, um, do you mean um, you've been provided a copy of the document by the inquiry? Yes. And um, this is the first time in the 19 years since the relevant events that you have um, seen the call log? I didn't see the call log at the time. And I had not seen it, I had never seen it until um, it was provided as part of the evidence set with the Rule 9 request. And so um, you say this is not something that was ever available to me during my time at Fujitsu. Um, to be clear, it wasn't available to you when you investigated the issue at Marine Drive back on the 26th of February 2004. It was not available to me then. And it was not available to you when you were asked to look at a wider range of issues in 2006 in preparation for the court case concerning Mr. Castleton? No, it wasn't available to me then, and I don't recall being asked to look at wider issues at that time either. Well, we know that, for example, you were um, uh, told before you gave evidence at the, um, at the High Court that you may be asked questions about the um, Calendar Square Falkirk bug. Yes, I was told that that was going to come up and I should be ready to answer questions about that. As part of preparation, you weren't shown a copy of the MBSE call log? No. Um, you tell us in this statement that there was a clear division uh, between business investigations conducted by the MBSC and systems investigations conducted by the SSC. Is that the reason why you in the SSC didn't see the MBSC call log? I presume so. The NBSC was a post office organisation, totally separate from Fujitsu, and I don't think at the help desk levels they either side had had view of the other's calls. The information we're going to look at in a moment concerning events on the 14th of January 2004 and the 21st of January 2004 would that um, have been helpful context for you to have had access to, to the investigation that you were to carry out? I don't think there was any additional evidence that would have been of, of help to me in the NBSC logs because I think that the Horizon Help Desk had captured certain, the majority of, of the information, again, either, I'd, I'm not sure now whether they got some of this information by talking to the NBSC agents or by talking direct to Mr. Castleton, but the Horizon Help Desk had, had captured in various calls um, I think probably all the, the pertinent information about what Mr Castleton was saying. OK, we'll look at that as we go along. C can you explain in general terms how you were passed information from the um, HSH, the help desk? They would log the information on their power help call. I think that was what the calls were called at that point in time and then they'd route the power help call onto a peak or pinnacle stack, and that would automatically raise, uh, I can't remember if it was peaks or pinnacles at this precise point in time, and would paste the information, the information that had been recorded on the power help call would also go on to the, would automatically go on to the newly raised peak that would then be on the, the SSC stack. And how would you be passed information from the MBSC? 
we were not passed information directly. It was, uh, it was a matter of the HSH having recorded it on, on their own call, power help call that they had raised. If you wanted to ask for more information from HSH, how would you do that? If we felt there was insufficient information from HSH, then we would route the call back to them saying we need some more information. If you wanted information from the MBSC, how would you do that? We very rarely contacted anybody at NBSC. I, I can't say we never did because I know there are a few calls where I did talk to, I think, somebody called Ibrahim, but I think um, in, in general it was HSH's responsibility to get a, a clear picture of, of what the postmaster said the problem was and then to route it on to us. I, I could have talked contacted the postmaster myself also if I needed more information, but in this case I didn't. And so essentially um, the Fujitsu HSH, the help desk, were your um, agents, um, were your, um, uh, your facility for obtaining information from either the postmaster or MBSC? Um, Yes, I'm not sure how often they would go back to NBSC to, to ask for, for more information themselves either, but certainly they would, um, they, they were expected to get a, a clear picture from the postmaster before sending the call over to, to SSC. Thank you. Can we look then at the f this first record of the call then? Um, Sorry, um, Mr. B, before we do that, and this may appear very pedantic, but Given the date of Mrs. Chambers' second witness statement, has she actually ever uh, vouched for its accuracy at the inquiry? That's a really good point. Um, I don't think she could have, really. Well, um, given that I couldn't have displayed it if I wanted to, um, you're right to pick me up on it. <laughs> it's all right. Um, with your leave then, sir, should we do that now? Yeah, I, I think, um, I think it, it must be the case that she hasn't done it, so we better do it. Um, and so now is as good a time as any. Turn to page 34, please. Yes. Um, is that your signature? Yes, that is my signature. And I don't believe we're in the territory of you wishing to make corrections to the witness statement. No. Are the contents of it true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for um, your eagle eyes. Can we um, look, please, at the first record of the call made by Mr. Castleton, the 14th of January 2004? It's LCAS 40365. And can we turn, please, to page 18? We can see here the NBSC call log. Yes? Do you recognise it now? I recognise it having been sent it by the inquiry. I couldn't, wouldn't have known what it was otherwise. Um, just um, uh, looking along the, the top line to orientate ourselves. Um, date, I think that's the call taken, first column. The incident ID, second column, a brief description of the event. Third column, a detailed description of the event. Fourth column, uh, resolution, fifth column. Do you know what KB means? No. I, I might guess knowledge base, but that's a guess. Um, a cross-reference to the incident log, a record of the nature of the call, the call type, uh, who the client was, the activity, the sub-activity, the branch code, the FAD code, and the uh, name of the post office concerned. Yes? Yes. Um, can we go, please, to page 25? Uh, 
And can you see, please, that this is an entry to of the 14th of January, 2004? Yes. At the foot of the page. Yep. And um, so this is the first relevant entry that we're going to look at, the first contact between Mr. Castleton and um, at the post office. And the 14th is a Wednesday. Okay, take it from me. Um, we can see the brief description is discrepancy. And then the detailed description is a discrepancy of, um, I think we can tell from looking elsewhere in the document where the hash sign appears, that's a pound sign, essentially, yeah. of 1,103 pounds and 13 pence loss. Resolution um, KB. If that does mean knowledge base, what would that mean? I've no idea. This was the NBSC system, which I had nothing to do with. And we can see um, some cross reference to an incident log, the call type, horizon balancing, the activity, cash account discrepancy, sub activity discrepancy, and then the branch code and the, the office name. Yes. Um, and if we just scroll down to the next page, we can see there's nothing else. It moves on to a different date, yeah? Uh -huh. Now, if we go back to that page on the 14th of January, um, what was your understanding of what should be done where a postmaster reported a discrepancy of say, a, a thousand pounds? I would expect, and I don't know, um, that MBSC would try and possibly help him to look through um, various reports and so on to see if there could have been any errors in recording data that might have led to that loss. I mean, just, just to be clear, I realise, of course, you didn't work in the MBSC. This was not your function. The purpose of these questions is to understand what um, you knew about what had been done before a call um, came across your desk. Yeah. And so on the face of this, it looks like nothing was done in relation to the report of a thousand pounds loss would you agree i don't know what they would have told him and i think you have to bear in mind that you know, discrepancies at branches are not at all unusual um, every branch will have had losses or gains occasionally which they will then have tried to resolve i mean obviously making sure that the, the cash has been counted correctly and, and that what they've recorded on the system, which they can check against the reports, is, is actually what they have done in the yes. office. And on the face of it, um, there isn't any record of that um, having been done on this occasion. It's not written down there, but no. I have no idea what the MBSC procedures were. But something is supposed to be done, isn't it, when a postmaster reports a discrepancy of £1,000? I don't know what the procedures were. But I would still say that, um, you know, it's, the, the, the first thing is to, to look for differences between what is on the system and, and what actually took place in the office, because that is the, the cause of, of discrepancies. Okay, can we move forwards a week then um, to the 21st of January 2004 and look at page 28? So this is the following Wednesday. And you'll see that um, it's a discrepancy again. Can you see that? Yes, I can. And the detailed description is Postmaster has cash account discrepancy of £4,294.67. Yes, I see that. Um, the resolution um, 
is sub postmaster still has a loss and has logged the call with suspense. Yes. What was your understanding of um, um, the suspense account? Um, that was somewhere to which they could move losses or gains while they were being investigated, but I think they were meant to get authorization from a particular team in post office in order to do that. Um, was it your understanding, I mean, it says here, and has logged call with suspense, that it was him, the postmaster, or he, the postmaster, that had to log the call with suspense, or the MBSC logged the call with suspense? I don't have any knowledge of the process. But one of the two would um, refer the gain or loss to a team dealing with suspense accounts, is that right? You understood that? I think that's probable, but really this, this was completely outside my knowledge. The next column recalls um, after the um, text in lowercase, in um, uppercase, checked through transaction logs with sub postmaster and nothing showed except the DDN. Did you understand that to refer to discrepancy? Uh, yes. Um, advised I will call him back tomorrow to see if anything came to light when he balanced um, OOH out of hours? Or wouldn't you know? Seems likely. Um, and log call with suspense um, if necessary. So this is before the postmaster, is this right, has balanced a, a record of the um, MBSC saying, you're telling me you've got a, um, a loss. Let's wait until you balance the next day. And if it's still there, we'll log the call with suspense. Yes, I seem to remember that Mr. Castleton tended to start going through the balancing process on the Wednesday afternoon, and the 21st would have been a Wednesday. Yes. And, but he didn't usually complete the final balance and produce the cash account until first thing on the Thursday morning. But if you'd been reading this at the time, you would have understood this to be a postmaster saying, look, I've already got a discrepancy, and they're saying you need to sign off your cash account the following day and see whether it's there. Um, if he hadn't got as far as the final balance, if he'd just done a trial balance, that would have produced a discrepancy, but he could then have gone back through to try and see if he could spot any reasons for that discrepancy. He could have then have changed the cash declaration or whatever other figures and done another trial balance. Um, so he's, he's started the process to the point that he's realised it's going to show, it it's, has created a discrepancy, but he hasn't actually completed the rollover process. And so um, I'll call back tomorrow to see if anything came to light. So that's the 21st. If we go over the page to um, the 22nd, We are at the next day. Brief description, um, discrepancy. Postmaster has a loss of £4,000. He was in the office until 11pm um, last night and could not find anything. Yep. Resolution went through all the balance checks with the postmaster. He had checked the REMS in and out. His cash stock and the P&A. Do you remember what the P&A was? Pensions and allowances. And he was unable to find the loss. Advise I would pass through to suspense. And so would you understand at this point that the postmaster had signed his cash account off by saying that there was a discrepancy, essentially, between the cash and stock which Horizon showed he should have and the cash and stock that he, in fact, had? Yes. And that um, uh, the MBSC are saying they're going to pass through to the suspense team. Yes? That's what they appear to be saying, yes. Yes. 
and you, you said, I think, earlier that your understanding was um, that the discrepancy, whether it was a gain or a loss, would be placed in a suspense account. That was a manual action that, if authorised, he, he could take, or I think it could be taken, it, it could be done even if not authorised, but my recollection is that they were meant to get some sort of authorisation. If um, a postmaster was um, placing an amount in the suspense account, or was authorised to place an amount in the suspense account, and was signing off the cash account, was it your understanding that he was acknowledging that he owed the money shown on the cash account if it was a loss? I, I had no idea of what the legal position no. might be on that money. Or, or, or was it your understanding that despite signing the cash account, the money was in effect disputed and that's why it was in the suspense account. Again, I don't know about the, 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 the business and the legal side of it. All I would see would, if I looked, was, was an amount being moved from one place on the system to another. I mean, to, to be clear, um, Mrs James, I'm not asking you for what your understanding of the legal position was, because I can't imagine you ever address your mind to it. It's more what you thought was signified by an amount being held in a suspense account? And was it that sum is disputed? Um, I'm not even sure if I knew that at that point, but then, yes, there's a loss and they've, they've parked it there. What did you think was the status of money then held in the suspense account? Or did you think nothing about that? I don't think I thought about it, just that it had been sort of, a, a sum had, had been parked there. Um, parked, um, did you have a, an understanding of parked for what purpose or, or parked until what? I, I don't think I really thought about it. Can we move forwards then to the 28th of January 2004 and turn to page 32? And so we're back to the next Wednesday, yes? Mm -hmm. The 28th. Third week, third Wednesday. Postmaster, I'm mean, reading under detailed description. Po Postmaster says, since broadband installed, every time he receives stock into the office, he is showing short by same amount, has checked to make sure remmed in properly, but still showing £2,500 short amount of stock. REM needs CB to check if accounting or system problem. Are you able to decode for us what that last part means? No. Do you know what CB referred to? No. Uh, resolution. Advise the postmaster that if he feels this is a technical problem to call the Horizon help desk. But after talking to the postmaster, he is entering all transactions okay. So this could be the case. Advise him to balance and roll for a definite figure, then to call the Horizon help desk. If no joy, call TP. Do you know what TP was a reference to? might have been the transaction processing team, but I'm, I'm not certain. Is what did the transaction processing team um, do? I don't know. I'm, I'm Were they part of post office or Fujitsu? Post office, I th think. I mean, there was, there was, a, there was a, a daily feed of, of figures at this point from Horizon um, to a, a post office team via a, a system called TPS. And so whether, I'm, I'm not, I really don't know, but it, it might have been a, a team inside post office who were getting transaction data at some level sent to them. But again, is this the same as the previous week, essentially, the post office saying to the sub postmaster, let's not sort your problem out now, 
do the end of week balance, fill out your cash account tomorrow, see if there's still an issue then. Um, that appears to be what they are saying. Now we've seen therefore here in the MB MBSC records, the postmaster was being told to call the Horizon help desk, the Fujitsu side of the house, if there remained a problem. So can we turn then to the Fujitsu side of the house to see whether um, there's anything in the Fujitsu records? Can we look please to Fujitsu 0012 2322? Are these a record of the um, power help calls? It, you have to um, uh, say something rather Sorry, than nod, yes. nod your head. Yes, I didn't realise it was a question. Yes. Uh, it was a, are these a record of the power help calls? And is the answer to yes. that yes? Okay. Um, and these are things that you would have had access to when you came to look at the problem on the uh, 26th of February 2004 but none of the documents we've looked at already? Yes. Okay. We can see that the call was opened on the 28th of January at 11.13. Can you see that in the middle? Yes. And it was closed eight minutes later on um, the same day at 11.21. Yes. Uh, we can see that the caller on the left-hand side is said to be Liam. I think that's supposed to be Lee. And if you look at the problem text, which is just over halfway down, caller states that discrepancies are going through on the system. This has been the case for three weeks in a row. Week one, 1,103 pounds down. Week two, 4,230 pounds, 97 down. Week three today, approximately 2,500 pounds. Can you see that? Yes, I can. And then all of that essentially matches what we've seen in the, the MBSC logs, doesn't it? In terms of the figures and the duration of the problematic events. Yes. And then if we go down, please, to the call activity log. Thank you. Uh, the first line of text at 11.11, .11, new call taken by Dane Mia caller states that discrepancies are going through on the system. This has been the case for three weeks in a row. And then the three figures we've seen are set out, yes? Yes. Caller states that these discrepancies have been relevant to the level of stock currently being held. Yes. And then uh, next, advised caller that this problem will need to be thoroughly investigated by MBSC before the issue can be investigated as a software problem. Yes. Transferred the caller to the MBSC so that the incident could be investigated further. Call closed. It's an MBSC issue, transferred. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Was this something that you came across um, frequently? Sub postmasters um, reporting um, losses or gains, discrepancies, and being passed from one organisation to the other with neither taking responsibility? I wouldn't say frequently, but yes, it did happen. You told us, I think, on the last occasion that you were concerned about people being bounced from MBSC to um, the help desk and back again. Yes. And does this appear to be an early example of it? Um... Yes, it appears to be an example of it, yeah. He had reported consistently calls to the MBSC. They'd not investigated them. They'd told him to contact the help desk at Fujitsu. He contacts the help desk at Fujitsu, and they tell him this has got to be thoroughly investigated by the MBSC. Yes. And so, and I, I think you can um, help us with this. You tell us in your witness statement, they need to turn it up now, the SSC wasn't involved at all at this time because the HSH bounced it back to MBSC and not created a 
uh, Pinnacle or a Peak? Yes. Thank you. Can we move um, forwards to the 29th of January, please, which is um, page LCAS 40365. And page 33, please. So he's back with the MBSC now, yes? Yes. The next day on the 29th, cash account discrepancy, detailed description, is showing a loss of £2,523.12. Says this is the third discrepancy in as many weeks. Resolution, check through figures using transaction log by mode and also amount looked at REMS. Declarate, sorry, at REMS declaration and cash flow. No trace of the discrepancy. Created call for suspense account team. Yes. So he's been to the MBSC three times. They've said on the last occasion, go to the, Hill, uh, the HSH. He's gone to the HSH. They say this needs to be fully investigated by the MBSC. He's gone back to the MBSC. They've said, we'll create a call and put the, uh, for the putting of the money in the suspense account. Does that appear to be that accurate? That appears to be what they're doing, yes. And so on the face of it, this call isn't being investigated by the MBSC. The money is just being put, or potentially being put, in the suspense account again. Yes, the, the NBSC are trying to help him find out what might be the cause of the discrepancy by helping him use the, the transaction log and, and checking the REM declarations, but they're unable to pinpoint anything there that might have caused the discrepancy. Can we move forward to later on um, the same day, I think, page 35? So still on the 29th, Detailed description. Postmaster would like to have his transactional archives looked at more closely to try to identify what is going wrong with his office. He is having a lot of losses over the last three weeks and thinks there is a system fault with his remittances. Yes. Resolution. I have followed KB instructions and sent an email to Adele Kilcoin. So, so Postmaster can study his archives to try and identify what has gone wrong. All details are in the log. Yep. Is that a request that you would encounter often at your many years working at Fujitsu, sub-postmasters wanting their, quote, transactional archives um, raked over? Um, this is an NBSC call log, so I can't really comment on 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 that. Um, I don't recall calls like that coming through to SSC in in, in particular. You can't remember many calls um, or incidents passed to the SSC where the sub-postmaster was asking for, as it's recorded here, his transactional archives looked at closely? I, no, I don't recall receiving calls at SSC that, that, that said that. Can we go back to the HSH, please? Um, Fujitsu 00122322. And look at page two, please. Still on the same day, so page two, thank you, the 29th of January 2004, you can see call open 1026 and 1031. I should make it clear, I'm not completely clear of the precise order of the last two documents and this one. These are timed, the other ones um, are not. 
But in any event, this is a, recall, a record of a call made the same day. And we can see that um, it lasted, or the log was open for um, five minutes. The caller on the left-hand side is recorded correctly this time as Lee, the postmaster. And we can see um, the problem text a third of the, pa the way down the page. Postmaster reports, um, I think he is having problems on his system connected to REMS. Every time he REMS in, it leaves him with a discrepancy. And he has been to the MBSC and back to us now and wants his system investigating. And then down to the call activity log. A new call taken by Mary Rainbow. Postmaster reports he's having problems on his system connected to REMS. Every time he REMS it in, leaves him with a discrepancy. He's been back to the MBSC and back to us. Sorry, he has been to the MBSC and back to us and now wants his system investigating. Advice. Advise the postmaster for this to happen. He needs to be re-referred from the MBSC. Call a referred to the MBSC. Call closed. Again, is that another example of what you told us about last time, postmasters being bounced between the two organizations? Yes. And then lastly, and um, before lunch, can we um, uh, look please at, at page three of this document, moving forward to the, um, the 13th of February, which is a Friday. Uh, caller, Lee Castleton, problem, Marie at MBSC, postmasters advised his system is doubling up cash declarations and cutting off checks. They still appear the next day. And then call activity log. A new call taken by Tony Law, Marie at the MBSC, postmaster advised his system is doubling up cash declarations and cutting off checks. They still appear the next day. The MBSC advised they have checked that he is cutting everything off properly. Just um, stopping there, what do you understand cutting off uh, to mean in the context of checks? Um, right at the end of each day, they had to print off a report of checks. They then, the checks had to be posted off somewhere I think with the report or a copy of the report as well and then there was a button that they had to press on the system to say I've done that and that effectively sort of drew a line under that set of checks so that they wouldn't appear on the next day's report. Thank you. So um, MBSC advised they've checked that he's cutting everything off properly cash figures are being done properly. Uh, postmaster has insisted on a system check. Skipping a line, problem has been happening for five weeks. Every time stock has been rimmed in, they have, a, they have had a loss that night. Snapshots and transaction logs agree with the postmaster's figures. What would you understand that to mean? Snapshots and transaction logs agree with the postmaster's figures. <coughs> Um, not entirely clear. I mean, a, a balanced snapshot was a report that they could print to get a picture of the, the current system figures. Um, but I don't know precisely what that sentence is meant to mean. It's meant, yeah. uh, Postmaster advised MBSC have done transaction logs, gyro bank logs, reconciliations, REMS in and out, and stock holding. Postmaster advised there is a Sunday DEX, but no one is on site to do this on a Sunday. Uh, Five weeks ago, Postmaster advised he did not rem in any stock last week and balance perfectly. Every week that he does rem stock in, the balance is wrong. Uh, escalated to Heather Drysden. Uh, Postmaster states that on the checks listing for the 11th, it states all of checks for the 10th as well. When I got him to go through at his checks, Postmaster stated that this happened more than once. But when going through his checks, it had actually happened just the once. Postmaster stated he was sure 
uh, sorry, he was sure he cut off. So I advised I would log all details and call back if it happens again. Call closed. Postmaster states his checks keep carrying over from the day before. Advise the postmaster to call back if it happens again. Yes? Yes. And so we see that um, in the course of this call, it's recorded that the postmaster insisted on a system check. Uh, that wasn't actioned at the time, was it? No, it appears that they followed up on the specific thing, problem with the, the checks listing, and which I think they did actually deal with correctly, but they didn't then go back to all the other issues that, that he was also um, reporting. They didn't go back to those? No, they only dealt with the, the checks listing part of what's the, and, the problems and, that he was and they having. Dealt, I'm sorry, and they dealt with that by saying, let's see whether it happens again. No, they... I think that probably what they did was get him to look at um, the events, the log of event, uh, repost events, which he could look at on his own system, which showed whether a report had been cut off on a particular day. And I mean, I know from having looked at that same data subsequently that yes, there was a day where, although he was under the impression that he had done a cut off, it, it had, had not been done. And that explained why the checks listing on the 11th included the checks from the 10th as well. You tell us in your witness statement that a failure to cut off checks wouldn't be connected to the cash discrepancy issue. No, it has no impact on the, the cash. And can you explain why, please? Um, because this, the, the cut-off just affected what showed on the, the checks report each day. As long as they'd remmed out the checks correctly, which they, they had done, that meant that the value of the checks had, had been removed from the, the system as it should be. Checks also didn't directly affect discrepancies because a, a discrepancy is a difference in the, in the cash totals. Thank you very much. So that would be a convenient moment before we move to um, the 25th of February 2004. I wonder whether we can break until five past two. Certainly, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>